So it is my pleasure to present our next speaker, Anna Wienhard from Heidelberg, Germany. The title of her, of her talk is An Invitation to Higher Teichmüller Theory. Thank you very much. So it's a great pleasure and honor um, to be here and to give this talk. And thanks to all of you who are, I mean, going strong at 6 o'clock in the evening. So um, what I want to do in my talk is to give you an invitation, so to invite you to higher Teichmüller theory. I will not give you an overview, but I will just want to show you some aspects of it, um, which hopefully some of them you find enticing. Before I explain to you what higher Teichmüller theory is, I want to start with a very um, simple um, object, which will, be, which will play an important role in my talk. And this is the circle and the real line, so mainly the circle. So if we look at the real line with its order and we take its uh, quotient, the circle comes with a positive orientation. So if we have three points on the circle, x, y, and z, we can say that they are positively oriented if we see them in po this order going around the circle having the interior to our left-hand side. Um, so in this case, we say x, y, z is a positive triple, and I want to recast this ordering um, slightly, thinking of this circle as the projective line, so thinking of points on the circle as lines in R2. I can assume that um, my line x is just um, the line formed by the second standard basis vector of um, R2, and my line z is formed by the first basis vector of R2, and then I can write any point y, which is not equal to z, as image of this 2 by 2 matrix, 1, ty, 0, 1, times e2, with ty being a, posi a, a real parameter. And the triple is positive if and only if this parameter is a positive real number. So I want to just keep this in mind, so we will come back to this later. Um, now, what I want to start with now is I take this circle and we want to take the circle and fill it with some more interesting life. And then we want to consider this circle as the boundary of the disk and more precisely as the boundary of the Poincaré disk. So we take the interior of the disk endowed with a Riemannian metric of constant curvature minus one. Then we have this matrix group SU1N, uh, SU11 acting by isometries on the Poincaré disk, so it acts by fractional linear transformation. This gives us the action by isometries. And if we look at this uh, nice uh, pattern, then the symmetry group of this tiling gives us a discrete subgroup of SU11 or SA2R. And if we look at the quotient space uh, of the disk by the action of this discrete subgroup, we get a hyperbolic orbifold. So a two-dimensional orbifold, but which comes equipped with a hyperbolic metric because we realize it as the quotient of the hyperbolic plane. So this correspondence between some of symmetry groups of tilings or discrete subgroups of the group of isometries of the Poincaré disk and hyperbolic structures on two-dimensional surfaces is really um, a very fundamental one and a very fundamental one for my talk. So if we more generally take a closed-oriented surface of genus G bigger or equal than 2, it carries a hyperbolic structure, and we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between putting a hyperbolic structure on the surface, on the one hand, or realizing the fundamental group of this surface as a discrete subgroup of the group of orientation-preserving isometries um, of the Poincaré disk. So when we do that, so take the fundamental group of the surface and realize it as a discrete subgroup preserving a tiling of the plane, we actually give an embedding of the space of all hyperbolic structures on the surface into the variety of homomorphisms of the fundamental group of the surface into the isometry group of the Poincaré disk, PSL2R, and it's well defined up to acting by conjugation with PSL2R. So this is uh, the realization of the space of all hyperbolic structures, which I want to look at in a bit more detail. So 
We embedded the space of hyperbolic structures into the representation variety, into the space of homomorphisms of pi 1 of S into PSL2R. It's clear from the construction that any um, homomorphism which we pick up in the image is a discrete embedding. That's basically by construction. It's due to um, basically a theorem of Andre Weil on the deformation rigidity of co-compact lattices in Lie groups, that it's not just a set of discrete and faithful representation, but it's actually a connected component of the space when we endow it with its natural topology, where if I consider two representations, if I, if I have a representation and I have a sequence of representations, I say it converges to another representation if it converges of all, on all elements of G pointwise. So by uniformization, Theorem, this space of hyperbolic structures can be identified with Teichmiller space, so every hyperbolic structure of constant curvature minus one, um, there's one unique in every conformal class, so that we can somehow switch between complex structures, conformal structures, and hyperbolic structures on the surface. I'm not going to use this uh, viewpoint a lot, it just uh, justifies somehow the name. So, here we have the example of Teichmiller space, and we will go to higher Teichmiller spaces in a, in a second. Before, I want to give you two ways of characterizing these set of hyperbolic structures as a um, subset of the representation variety. So the first is these representations in, which come from hyperbolic structures are what we call, can call positive representations. So the first observation is if you look at your fundamental group of the surface and you look at a representation into PSL2R, a discrete faithful representation you get from a, from a hyperbolic structure, will act orientation preserving on the boundary of the disk at infinity. But moreover, it's a positive representation in the following sense. So whenever I pick a representation which comes from a hyperbolic structure, I get with it an equivariant continuous map from the circle or the projective line to the circle which preserves positivity. So it sends positively oriented triplets to positively oriented triplets or positive triplets to positive triplets. So there's one point I want to make here that somehow you wonder, I mean on the right hand side it's clear what this circle means, it's the boundary of the Poincare disk. On the left hand side um, it's less clear what this circle means, so we just have the fundamental group of a surface, but there's a natural identification of the boundary of this group with a circle um, as an oriented compact manifold. So representations which come from hyperbolic structures are positive representations. They can also be characterized by a characteristic number, namely those are representations which are of maximal Euler number. So, I want to shortly tell you, uh, recall what the Euler number is. So the Euler number is the obstruction to taking your re representation from pi 1 of S into PSL2R and lift it to the universal covering of PSL2R. Um, it has a very elementary description. So if we take the fundamental group of the surface, we can write an explicit presentation of it as ge generated by two G generators, which satisfy this relation, so the product of the commutators uh, is one. And we can get the Euler number by just somehow doing what we want to, what we try to do. So we take every generator and we lift it. We, we have, I mean, AI is the image of small AI in PSL2R, and we try to lift it to PSL, uh, to the universal cover. So we have this sequence of two G lifts, then we try to compute this commutator, the commutator, the product of commutators will not depend on what lift we chose. And in the end, we get an element which, if we project it to PSL2R, is the identity. So it lies in the, um, in the center of the, of the universal cover. So it's, it will just give us an integer. And by uh, the, an inequality of Milner and Wood, it's an integer in this. Um, in this interval, 2 minus 2g, or 2g minus 2, where g is the genus of the surface. And Goldman showed that if it if it's, has maximal Euler number, so Euler number 2g minus 2, then actually this representation comes from a hyperbolic structure. So now I want to go and just tell you what higher Teichmiller spaces are. So the idea 
is basically once we have this description of Teichmiller space or the space of hyperbolic structures as a subset of the space of representations, we can ask ourselves, well, what is if we replace PSL2R by a different Lie group? And in particular, what happens if we replace it by a Lie group of higher rank? So a Lie group where the maximal abelian subgroup, which is diagonalizable over R, is not just one dimensional, but of dimension two or higher. And so the some more definition I want to take in this talk of what a higher Teichmiller space is, is that it is a union of connected components of this space of homomorphisms where I take the fundamental group of a surface, I look at homomorphisms into a Lie group of higher rank, and I want to find union of connected components where every single representation is discrete and faithful. So this is actually an a posteriori definition of higher Teichmiller spaces, and it's not how we started to think or discover higher Teichmiller spaces. So um, there, the discovery of higher Teichmiller spaces came really from very different areas um, in mathematics, and they come in two families. So there's one family which was defined by Hitchin, and it's uh, called the Hitchin component, which exists when your group G is a split real form, and I'm not going to define what this is, so if you don't know, think about SLNR. And the other family, which is the space of maximal representations, exists in a for different family of Lie groups, namely when G is of Hermitian type. This you can take as a definition that the fundamental group of G is infinite cyclic, or you can think, if you want to think of the geometry associated to this Lie group, its symmetric space is a symmetric space of Hermitian type, which means that you have an invariant um, a Keller form on it, which is invariant under the isometry group of the manifold. So we have, for these two families, we have um, higher Teichmiller spaces, and I will really not work, uh, tell you anything about the general case G, but I want to focus on SLNR and SP2NR. So the first um, interesting case, which is not Teichmiller space, is for SL3R. In this case, the Hitchin component for SL3R has a very nice geometric interpretation. So we saw uh, we are in the situation of Teichmiller space for PSL2R. We modeled our surface, our hyperbolic surface. We could model it on the Poincaré disk. So a point in the Hitchin component you can identify with a surface which is modeled on a convex domain um, in projective space. So you can think of it as somehow starting with hyperbolic structures. If you think of the Klein model of the um, hyperbolic space in dimension two, which is the interior of a disk in projective space, then you start deforming this um, disk in projective space to more more complicated convex uh, projective set, and this somehow gives you deformations in the Hitchin component for n equals 3. So I want to give you the definition of both Hitchin component and space of maximal representation. So the Hitchin component for SLNR, one way to define it is to say it's the connected component containing a preferred representation, namely what we call an irreducible function representation. So you basically try to come up with a nice representation in SLNR by doing what you already know, what you can do with a surface group. We know we can endow the surface with a hyperbolic structure, put the surface group into SL2R, and now we put SL2R into SLNR via the irreducible representation in dimension N. And then we just say we get all the other deformations which deform, which can be deformed to that. Um, the space of maximal representations is defined in a completely different way. So it's defined somehow more from an intrinsic point of view. So if you're, uh, we had the Euler number as an obstruction of lifting a representation from SL2R to the universal cover of SL2R. In the same way for the symplectic group, or more generally, Lie groups of permission type, you have an obstruction of lifting the representation to the universal cover, which is um, often called the Toledo number, it's defined the same way as the Euler number. So you start lifting your generators and you try to see what you come up with. In the end, the relation gives you an element of the integers and it will be bounded now by 
again in an interval where the, the upper bound is 2g minus 2 times n, where n is the rank of this group, or two in the lower bound 2 minus 2g times n. And so maximal representations are those where the Toledo number um, is equal to this um, upper bound. So they are defined extrinsically. It's still clear, because this is a characteristic number, that they form a union of connected components. So um, in this um, slide claiming that these are families of Teichmüller, higher Teichmüller spaces, I already hide some uh, results about them, namely that everything which is, oh, sorry, in the Hitchin component um, is actually a discrete a faithful representation, which is not a priori clear, and which in this situation has been proved by Laboury and independently by Fock and Gonshoff. And same for the maximal representations, I uh, hide somehow that there is every maximal representation is a discrete embedding, which is a result of Mark Burger, Alessandro Yotzi, and myself. So, um, what I want to show you a little bit of is that these higher Teichmüller spaces. Now, why do we call them higher Teichmüller spaces? Because they um, have a lot, share a lot of properties with classical Teichmüller space, thought of as this subset or connected component in the space of representations. Um, and the starting point for this is a theorem of Hitchin from 92, where he defined the Hitchin component using methods from the theory of Higgs bundles and showed using these methods that this Hitchin component, which you just define as a connected component containing one specific representation, has an important property which you know from Teichmer space, namely it's homeomorphic to a vector space. And uh, somehow raised the question, what are the reasons for this to happen? And then, particularly in the, in the past uh, 15 to 20 years, there have been many different results, people working on trying to find properties that make higher Teichmüller spaces look a lot like Teichmüller space. So whatever some of property you know for Teichmüller space, you can ask yourself for higher Teichmüller spaces. And we have seen many results which show that there are a lot of similarities. What I want to, um, what I find this in some sense even more interesting than finding similarities sometimes is that we also find new, new features and new interesting features which arise. And I want to Mention two. So the first is that there's somehow new arithmetic questions which arise for higher Teichmüller spaces, which are not present for classical Teichmüller space. Namely, if you look at the representation in the space of um, hyperbolic structures, then there you don't find any integral representation. So you don't find any representation where all the generators and every element of G are mapped to integral two by two matrices, because this is just not possible for a closed surface. But for higher Teichmüller spaces, you can actually find infinitely many not mapping class group um, equivalent integer points for closed surfaces. And so this opens up a completely new um, problem, namely you have infinitely many, you know, try to count them and try to analyze the counting function, and it's a problem where we have no idea really how to tackle this at the moment. But I think it's a very interesting new connection of higher Teichmüller spaces to some arithmetic questions. Another thing I want to um, shortly highlight that we saw the topology of the Hitchin component is just a vector space, so it's contractible, it's trivial. This is not true for maximal representations, so maximal representations have non-trivial topology. And there's a, a curious thing which happens for the symplectic group SP4R, that there are actually connected components in the space of maximal representations, where every representation is risky dense, so you cannot get any of this representation by doing the simple-minded thing of putting your representation into SL2R and putting SL2R into SP4R and then deforming. But they're generally different than deformations of representation in SL2R. So I now want to um, show you two, um, just, I mean, two glimpses of other properties of the Hitchin component and the space of maximal representations, where you see both old and new features appearing. So some new features, but then somehow also some similarities with Teichmüller space. So um, I want to first highlight this in the Hitchin component and then in the space of maximal representations. 
So in order to do that, let me recall one classical um, thing of Teichmuller space, and I mean the Fenchel-Nielsen parametrization. So if I have a hyperbolic structure on a surface, I can um, parametrize it in the following way. So I fix a pair of pants decomposition of the surface. So I cut my surface along, along simple closed um, disjoint geodesics in these pair, pair of pants, in these three whole spheres. And if I look at the hyperbolic structure on such a pair of pants, it's completely determined by the length of the three boundary curves. So if I want to reconstruct my hyperbolic st structure on the surface, I have to record the length of these three boundary curves. So this gives me, for these three g minus three curves of my pants decomposition, gives me three g minus three length functions, length um, parameters. And then I can, so whenever I glue a pair of pants, I have a freedom of twisting. Um, so I can glue it in one way or I can twist it. Um, twisted round. So I have, in addition to the 3g minus 3 length parameters, I have 3g minus 3 twist parameters. And knowing this 6g minus 6 parameters, I can recover the hyperbolic structure on the surface. So this um, parameterization gives us not just a parameterization, it gives us also interesting deformations uh, and natural deformations of the hyperbolic structure on the surface. Namely, I can keep the length of all the curves fixed, so I keep my puzzle pieces of the, of the pair of pans I have, but now when I glue them, I glue them in a different way. So I can just, if I, f if I fix uh, one of these simple closed curves, I can cut my surface and then continuously twist more and more around this, around this curve. And this way I get a one parameter family of different hyperbolic structures on the surface. So these deformations go under the name of fentyl knees and twist flows, and they have a very nice um, structure. So there is a natural symplectic structure on the space of homomorphisms, which I'm not going to explain. But if you, if, if you look at this natural symplectic structure, then these twist flows are actually Hamiltonian flows um, where the Hamiltonian function which defines them is the length function of the curve where you twist. And um, there's, so on the Teichmüller space, if, I mean this natural symplectic structure actually um, can be then written very precisely and very nicely in this form um, using the length and twist parameters, so in what is called Wolpert's formula. So the symplectic structure is just the one form coming from the length function, the one form wedge the one forms coming from the twist functions. And if you look at this and that the twist flows are Hamiltonian flows, you see that if you do twist the twist flows at all the three G minus three disjoint curves, they all commute with each other and they give Teichmüller space with this symplectic structure, the structure of a completely integrable system. So part of this story actually survives in quite generality when you change from PSL2R to an arbitrary Lie group. So this symplectic structure has been um, defined on the representation variety of the fundamental group of a surface with, into any Lie group G by Goldman. And when you have a simple closed curve, you have more general length functions because basically you can take the traces of this element um, in your group G. And you can look at generalized twist flows, which are actually Hamiltonian flows of this length function. So this is a story. Uh, which was developed quite generally by, uh, by Bill Goldman. But what happens now when we apply this for the Hitchin component, or the, uh, um, let's just think of the Hitchin component for n equals three, is that um, if we cut our surface into pairs of pans and we record the lengths um, of the curves or the holonomy around the boundary curves, this actually does not determine the pair of pans anymore. But a pair of pans in, when G is not SL2R but SLNR has internal parameters and I want to explain shortly what these per internal parameters are for um, SL3, so in this case of convex projective structures on the surface. So we focus on one uh, pair of pans and if I have a pair of pans, I can cut it into two ideal triangles. So think of this pair of pans as, I mean, if it were just the uh, three punctured sphere, uh, then you would just cut it in, in an ideal triangle. And now you somehow open up the 
cusp and you take these triangles and you wrap them around infinitely often around the boundary loop. So you cut the pair of pants into these two triangles and so what you have is somehow the, uh, here two triangles, two ideal triangles in this pair of pants. And what happens now is that for the hyperbolic, in the hyperbolic case, any, every ideal triangle is isometric to every other ideal triangle. But if you look at, for example, convex real protective structure, so in the Hitchin component for SL3R, this is not true anymore. But there is an invariant called the triple ratio, which is an invariant of an ideal triangle in your convex protective set. And let me illustrate what the triple ratio is. So a triangle, when you take, when you realize, have a convex real protective structure on the surface, you have a triangle and it's, it's actually two triangles. So you have these three points, P1, P2, P3, which form the triangle. But at every, you are at the boundary of a convex set. It has a nice tangent line. And so you also have the bigger triangle, which is formed by these tangent lines. And so this configuration of an ideal triangle in a convex protective uh, domain has an invariant which, uh, I mean, there's the triple ratio. And one way to think of this invariant is that you take one of these dotted lines and you see on this uh, line you find four points. You find this point P1, which was one point of your triangle. You find this intersection point, this intersection point, and the intersection point of the two opposite tangents. This gives you four points on a line, and four points of a line have an invariant, namely the cross ratio. So the triple ratio is basically the cross ratio of these four lines, and um, you can take any, well, you could also take this dotted line, this dotted line, you actually end up getting the same cross ratio um, function. So this triple ratio counts for the internal parameter of the pair of pans. And so now you get, uh, if you want to deform a representation in this Hitchin component, you can of course deform and twist, um, but this will never change the internal parameter. So you want to come up with a deformation which also changes the internal parameter. And I want to describe such a, um, uh, such a deformation which uh, first as just a deformation of this triangle um, and the deformation of this triple ratio. So, I mean, you see in this picture, I already have more things in this picture, namely having this configuration of these three points on these three tangent lines, I can construct this picture and have three domains here, omega 1, omega 2, omega 3, which cut my convex um, domain into these three um, domains and the internal triangle. And so I can apply uh, three different projective transformations to these three pieces and then glue them back together. And when I glue them back together, I will have a, the somehow empty space in the middle. The triangle will have a different, uh, longer side. So I will change the triple ratio uh, by a factor of t. So this way, we can somehow um, define a deformation of this uh, triangle and the deformation of this triple ratio by what we call an eruption flow. So you think of this some of small try, I mean this whole thing as a, in 3D as a volcano and applying the eruption flow, you open up the, uh, the hole, the, the crater in the middle. So now we want to put this eruption flow on this pair of pans and we want to do it in such a way that the boundary, the holonomy around the boundary stays fixed. To do this, you actually have to you have these two triangles, so you apply a positive eruption flow on one and a negative on the other. And this way, you deform the internal structure of the pair of pans while keeping the holonomy around the three boundary loops fixed. So by doing that, we now have some enough twist flows which come from the general construction and these eruption flows in the interior. And if you analyze them with respect to the symplectic structure, you get that they again are Hamiltonian flows which Poisson commute and so they give you the structure of an integrable system, completely integrable system on the Hitchin component. So this is somehow we have new features, these internal parameters, uh, but actually we can use them to show that uh, something which is similar to Teichmann space, namely our space has um, the structure of a completely integrable system and there's a generalization of Wolpert's formula somehow using um, these internal parameters, the length and the twist functions. So now I want to 
come to um, what I want to illustrate for maximal representations. This also is related with uh, parametrizations. And now we take a surface which is not a closed surface but has a puncture. And if you have a surface with a puncture, there's a nice way of parametrizing representations by ideal triangulation. So it's a bit similar to what we did for Fenty Nielsen parametrizations. And there we chose a pair of pants decomposition and we cut it into ideal triangles every pair of pants. So here we just take our surface, we have a, pu a puncture which we think of as a point at infinity and we can triangulate the surface so that all the vertices of the triangulation sit in the puncture. So we have an ideal triangulation and so if we, if, if we want to parameterize our hyperbolic structure, again we cut it into pieces which are hyperbolic ideal triangles, so they have no invariant, they are on the same, and the real information of the hyperbolic structure comes on gluing the hyperbolic triangles together. So these, um, there are shear coordinates which have been introduced by um, Thurston and uh, some other cast in general case by Fock and Gontroff under the name X coordinates. And to do that, we take our representation, we take our surface, we cut it into ideal triangles. We endow it with additional information, namely along for all each boundary loop. We want to decorate our representation by choosing a line in projective space, so in RP1, so a point on the circle. And then if we, we build parameters locally in the following way, so if you have if you see two triangles glued together, you have four um, boundary points. So you have four lines in RP1. So there's again an invariant of four lines in RP1 is the cross ratio. And this is the invariant you would put on, each, on an edge where two triangles are glued. So this we can do and we get a parameterization which depends on the triangulation we chose. So now there are very interesting things which happen when we change the triangulation and the easiest way to change a triangulation is to take two uh, quadrilateral, so two triangles glued together and to flip the edge. So instead of thinking of these as two hyperbolic triangles glued along this edge, we flip the edge and we have two triangles glued along this other edge. And then there are the formulas, uh, there are well-known formulas how the um, how the, invariant change, how the invariants change, how the cross ratio changes, which are given by this, um, this formula. There's a related um, parameterization when we put more decoration on the corner, so when we don't just um, choose a line in projective space for each uh, boundary loop, but actually also pick a vector in this line, so a vector generating this line. Then there are so-called lambda lengths or A coordinates, so where I mean, this A0, you can think of, you have two vertices which are joined by an edge, so every vertex has a vector associated to it, and you take the determinant of these two vectors. There's a more geometric uh, picture to think about it, so choosing this vector is the same as choosing a horse cycle around the puncture, and then this, these AIs are basically the, uh, the distance between the two horror cycles you chose. So these uh, coordinates also satisfy interesting relations. So if we make a flip at this edge, the coordinates here around don't change, but the coordinate on this edge changes by this formula. And one thing you see is that all the formulas are positive rational functions. So if I start with positive coordinates and I flip, all the coordinates stay positive. And this is um, something which was um, observed in great generality by Fock and Gontroff for um, also all, uh, they give a generalization of this for all Hitchin components and make a very precise um, connection of this to cluster algebra. So I'm not going to tell you what cluster algebra is. It's a combinatorial object, certain commutative algebras which appear in representation theory and many other um, somehow interesting areas of mathematics. I just, um, so if you, if you know cluster algebras, they gi this gives you a connection to cluster algebras. If you don't know cluster algebras, uh, the, the coordinate changes you have when flipping an edge of your triangulation are very special positive rational functions. So when we look at uh, this space of maximal representation for the symplectic group, you can actually do a similar thing. And um, what 
is something which was very surprising to us in a sense is that when you do that, you get a geometric realization of um, a non-commutative cluster algebra, which has the flavor of a non, uh, of basically a non-commutative version of what you see for Teichmüller space, and which has been studied before by Bernstein and Rettak. And I want to just tell you shortly what uh, you do. So there are certain x coordinates where, I mean, you dec the decoration you do at the punctures is now you don't take lines in R2, but you take Lagrangian subspaces in R2n. And there are cross ratios which you can associate to them, which give you um, coordinates which are now not scalars, so not one by one positive definite matrices, but n by n positive definite matrices. And what is really, uh, what was uh, uh, really a surprise for us when we, uh, when we did that is that when you compute the change of coordinates in this way, you see the same formula but, I mean, if you see this formula, you have to interpret in this way. So you multiply matrices, and this is not commutative, but you multiply with the square root from both sides. And similar, if you fix not just the Lagrangian subspace, but fix now a basis of this Lagrangian subspace, you get coordinates which, um, uh, where scalars go to now invertible matrices, and the change of coordinates, which you see here, has somehow has a non-commutative uh, version, and this is really the formula which which shows you um, almost on the nose that it's this non-commutative cluster algebra which was studied by Bernstein and Rettak. So this, I just wanted to give you two ways of somehow what new features and old features appear for Hitchin components and maximal representations, and I want to, um, and uh, in the last uh, nine minutes, I want to. Uh, focus a bit on common features for Hitchin representations and maximal representations. And so one common feature is that both Hitchin representations and maximal representations are examples of a class of representations of more general discrete subgroup, finitely generated groups in Lie groups, namely Anosov representations. And I will not give you the definition. I, if you are interested in that, I encourage you to go to Fanny Cassell's um, talk next week. Um, but so they give us new examples of interesting and structurally interesting discrete subgroups of higher rank Lie groups. Another um, common feature um, which actually comes out of them, these uh, representations being examples of an Ossoff representation is that they all are holonomy representations of geometric structures, but not anymore on the surface, but on higher dimensional compact manifolds. And again, I'm not going to say anything about that. What I want to um, explain to you that another common feature is that they are both um, Hitchin components and maximal representations are po so-called positive, what we can call positive representations. And let me um, give you what I mean by that. So if you have a representation in the Hitchin component, you can characterize it in terms of positive maps from the circle to a flag variety in the same way as we characterize um, the representations coming from hyperbolic structures. So a representation is in the Hitchin component if and only if there's a continuous equivariant map from the circle now into the flag varieties and sending positive triples to positive triples of flags. And I have to tell you what positive triples of flags mean. So if I have a triple of flags F plus F, F minus, I call it positive if and only if F can be written as a unipotent matrix times F plus, where this unipotent matrix is totally positive. So when do you call a matrix totally positive? A unipotent matrix is totally positive if every minor which is allowed to be non-zero is actually positive. And these no, to total positive matrices have very interesting properties and play a role in many um, areas of mathematics and uh, statistical mechanics. So this is the notion of positivity which characterizes Hitchin components. There's a related characterization of maximal representations. So uh, I can also characterize a maximal representation as a representation where, for which I have a uh, continuous equivariant map from the circle 
um, to the space of Lagrangian, which sends positive triples to positive triples. And again, what's the definition of positivity here? So I have L plus L, L minus is positive if and only if I can write L as the image of L plus by this upper block triangular matrix, where this matrix PL is a positive definite symmetric matrix. And an equivalent characterization, if you're familiar with the Maslow index, is that the Maslow index of these three Lagrangians is maximal. But it's really this way which lets you, I mean, makes this look, this positivity and this positivity look very much alike and very much like the, our recast of the positive triples on S1. So if we look at this positivity, um, the first notion of positivity as it uh, stems from this totally positive unipotent matrix. There's a more general theory of total positivity um, generalized by Lustig to all split real Lie groups. And the other positivity we saw in the space of Lagrangians, which can be described by the Maslow index or by this cone of positive definite symmetric matrices, also generalizes and comes really from uh, positivity in the, uh, in the context of Hermitian symmetric spaces and Lie groups of Hermitian type, which has to do with orders on Lie groups. But in fact, you can characterize them in the same way, namely in both uh, cases, if we look at the set of positive triplets, it's a connected component of the intersection of two Bruhas cells, and this connected component has the structure of the semigroup. So basically, I mean, we took F plus, F minus, and if we look at all the, f in some flag variety, if we look at all the flags which are transverse to F plus and transverse to F minus, then this set of flags decomposes in several connected components, and one of them, namely the one where our positive triples land, has the structure of a semigroup. I mean, for SA2, the example is, here it's simple, the Bruhas cell for x is just everything which is not, all the points which are not equal to x, and all the points which are not equal to z, so we have these points and these points, and these um, can be identified for r positive and r negative. So we can take this as a definition and say a simple Lie group admits a positive structure with respect to a generalized flag variety when we find in the intersection of any two um, we have cells of transverse flags, a connected component which has the structure of the semigroup. And when you do that, you can actually classify which Lie groups have this structure. And um, you see that there are the two families of Lie groups we already saw, but there are two other families of Lie groups which have this structure, which have not been considered so far. So there's the, uh, the groups which are um, orthogonal groups of quadratic forms with indefinite signature. And there you have a positive structure with respect to the fl partial flag variety, which consists of an isotropic line, an isotropic two plane, up to an isotropic P minus one plane. And there's an exceptional family, so there are four exceptional groups which have a reduced root system um, uh, given by, by F4 and a partial flag variety here. So what you see when you analyze this uh, new positive structures is that a lot of the properties of Lustig's total positivity actually persist even though we don't have um, the tools which Lustig uses to prove this property. So his proof relies on representation theoretic things like uh, canonical basis and positivity with respect to this. We don't have this but uses, replacing this by geometric properties, a lot of the properties uh, persist. So I don't want to go into detail um, of that, so if you're interested I can tell you more about that. But I want to um, apply this now to study representations. So um, before I do that I just want to add one comment. So there, we had this relation to cluster algebras before this cluster relation comes really from I mean, it's really connected to this Lustig total positivity showing up there. And since we have a lot of the features of Lustig positivity, what we expect is that from this we also get new examples of non-commutative cluster algebras, which are not the simplest case, um, somehow, uh, like non-commutative versions of the SA2 cluster variety, cluster algebra, but of more general um, and more complicated um, Dinkin diagrams. 
So now, we, what happens when we apply this positivity to representation? So we have a notion of positivity of triplets from our positive structure, so we can just look at the space of positive representations as those when we have a continuous equivalent map from the circle to our flag variety where we have positive triplets, which sends positive oriented triplets on the surface to positive triplets of flags. So this set of representations is not empty. So for example, in this case of SOPQ, I give you two examples which come from embedding SL2R. So we embed the surface group via hyperbolic structure into SL2R. Then we embed SL2R via the 2P minus 1 dimensional reducible representation into SOPP minus 1. And then we can embed SOPP minus 1 into SOPQ. And we can do this similar thing but taking here the 2P plus one dimensional reducible representation and embedding this into SOPQ. So this gives you two different, and then you can deform. Um, why can you deform? Because what we can show for these positive representations is that every positive representation is discrete and faithful. Is Anosov and the set of positive representations is open, and the set of positive representations is closed, but only among irreducible representations. What we conjecture is that it's actually closed on the nose. So we conjecture that we have other higher Teichmuller spaces for these families of positive structures, and that actually the positivity is the reason for the existence of higher Teichmuller spaces. This also leads to the prediction that there are more connected components when you have these positive structures, and this prediction, so not the first one, but the second one, has been conformed, confirmed for SOPQ. So, and the conclusion, I just, I mean, I, higher Teichmuller space come from very different points of view, but we have a common underlying structure named this notion of positivity. And what I want to show you is that what we see and what I try to show you a little bit of it is just the tip of the iceberg, but there's a lot to be discovered underneath the surface. And so I really want to invite you to somehow get on your diving gear, jump into the water, and explore other connections of higher Teichner spaces to other areas of mathematics. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you. Um, you, s you gave the example of SL3 uh, as parametrizing projective structures. Um, is the, um, is Tashima, higher Tashimura spaces, are they always moduli spaces? Yes, but we don't, ha so we have a very set, we have a rather satisfactory answer for SL4 and SP4 where they parametrize um, projective structures on the unit tangent bundle of the surface, um, which are not convex, but have some convex foliations. Um, and we have a general statement which says that they always, so, every, so the Hitchin component for, say, any n is um, isomorphic to uh, the uh, one connected component of the deformation space um, for an even of a protective of protective structures on a compact manifold, but we don't uh, know in general how to um, how to characterize the structure synthetically. So what properties this structure has so that the holonomy is actually in the Hitchin component. So we, in some sense, just have, in general, we just have one direction. So if I have a Hitchin component, I can construct for you a compact manifold um, with a nice geometric structure, but, but I can't it. give you the properties of this geometric structure, which somehow makes you fall in the Hitchin component. So it's always a projective structure on some variety related to... Yes, so it's, uh, so for SLN, with an even, it's a projective structure on a compact manifold, which is homeomorphic to uh, an ON mod ON minus 2 bundle over the surface. And for an odd, it's actually you don't get a projective structure in general. You get uh, the structure, you model the manifold on a line in a hyperplane, so on the space of lines in a hyperplane, so a partial flag variety. 
And in the general case, we can give you the flag variety, but we, I cannot tell you what the topology of the manifold is in general. So what we conjecture is that's always a, comp a bundle over the surface, but we only know that basically for SL2N, SL2N plus one, and uh, the symplectic group, but not in general. Okay, and last question. Um, do you have a description of the boundary? Uh, of, do you have a compactification of those higher Teich Muller spaces? Um, partly, yes. So for, the, uh, so, uh, so for the space of maximal representation, there's work of um, Borger and Pozzetti, and then Borger, Pozzetti with Yotzi and Perot, who have a program of somehow constructing a compactification which is similar to um, the Thurston compactification of Teich Muller space. And for the, I mean, Hitchin component for SLN, you also have that. And what you have in, uh, I mean, when you look at punctured surfaces, Fock and Gontroff have uh, ways of compactifying this space somehow using tropical, tropical geometry. But again, there are a lot of questions. I'm not going to say them now, but we can discuss. There are a lot of questions about this compactification which we don't, um, don't know yet. So. Any other question? Okay, so thank you again.